One more thing here, it says that the Astros will win tonight. So, so that's a thing. We're going to be getting a new series this week that I will speak more about in just a minute, but I'd like to invite Norlin to come up and read our scripture this morning from the book of Galatians. So take a listen as Norlin leads us in the scripture. Today's reading comes from Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. I invite you to follow the scripture printed in the bulletin insert as I read from the message translation. Christ has set us free to live a free life, so take your stand. Never again let anyone put a harness of slavery on you. I'm emphatic about this. The moment any one of you submits to circumcision or any other rule-keeping system, at that same moment, Christ's hard-won gift of freedom is squandered. I repeat my warning. The person who accepts the ways of circumcision trades all the advantages of the free life in Christ for the obligations of the slave life of the law. I suspect you would never intend this, but this is what happens when you attempt to live by your own religious plans and projects. You are cut off from Christ. You fall out of grace. Meanwhile, we expectantly wait for a satisfying relationship with the Spirit. For in Christ, neither our most conscientious religion nor disregard of religion amounts to anything. What matters is something far more interior, faith expressed in love. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Welcome and good morning once again. My name is Thomas Harper. I'm an associate pastor here at St. Luke's. And as I said, we're going to begin a new sermon series this morning, one that just so happens to line up with our fall all-church study for small groups. For the next four weeks, we're going to be talking about taking a look at Paul's letter to the Galatians. If you are in a participating Sunday school class or in a lift group, then you already kind of have an idea about what's going on. But if you're new to the party, I uh, just want to let you know that you can still download the Scripture Shared app and follow that study of the same name, Freedom, Life, and the Spirit, uh, as we go through these next four weeks. And I would really encourage you to do so because it really, there's a lot going on on that app. There's weekly readings that are written by Dr. Pace and various other associate pastors. Uh, each week they videotape Dr. Pace talking about a certain scripture from Galatians. And it really goes deep into the context of what was going on uh, in the early church at the time. But for our purposes this morning, we're going to kick off this sermon series by talking about the problem with works in religion. Would you pray with me? Father God, open us up. Open us up that we might receive a word from you today. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would speak through me, or if need be, in spite of me, so that we might know your heart more. And then in turn, Lord, that we would know ourselves a little bit better. God, in that truth, would you then compel your church into action? In your son's name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. So most scholars believe that Galatians was one of Paul's earliest written letters, happening somewhere around 50 to 55 AD. And if that's true, then that means that the writing of Galatians actually predates the writing of the Gospels. Jesus died around 33 AD, but the Gospels about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection weren't actually written until, say, about 70 to 90 AD. So that means in Galatians, we're really only about 20 years removed from the life of Jesus. That would be like if I stood up before you this morning telling stories about the Rockets back-to-back -back NBA championships that took place in the mid-90s. Now, sure, there might be some of you here who don't have a recollection of that or weren't around or missed that. But for the most part, most of you know exactly what I'm talking about because you lived it. You saw it with your own eyes. So it's a great comfort to me to know that some of our earliest Christian writings really aren't that far removed from the events at which they are written about. In our scripture reading this morning, Paul has some seriously strong words for the Galatians. He says things like, I'm here to tell you, if you let, if you let yourself become circumcised, then Jesus is going to be of no benefit to you. Christ has set you free. 
Why then are you going back to slavery? So what's going on here? Well, Paul is speaking to a group of Gentiles, which means people who are not Jewish. And he's telling them that you don't need to follow the various customs and laws of the Jewish faith in order to be a follower of Jesus. Apparently what happened was Paul is on his mission to bring the gospel to the Gentiles, preaching the good news of Jesus Christ, and people are getting it. People are being transformed. They are being uh, empowered by the Holy Spirit and praising Jesus' name. But then some other religious leaders come in behind Paul and say, hey, it's great that you love Jesus and all, but if you really want to be his disciple, if you really want to follow him, then you need to be circumcised. You need to become a Jew. And this ticks Paul off and prompts him to write this letter to the Galatians, saying, why are you listening to these people who are telling you that you have to become circumcised? Haven't you already received the Holy Spirit? Why then would you heap a bunch of worthless customs and laws on top of that? And what's worse, those people who are telling you that you have to follow all these laws, they don't do it themselves. There's no way that the law can make you righteous. Because if you want to be righteous by the law, you have to follow all the laws perfectly. Something that no one is able to do. So all throughout Galatians, Paul reiterates over and over again that the law cannot make us righteous. Only our faith alone in Jesus can make us righteous. So this might sound like Christianity 101. And, I mean, basically it is. But it was a big deal back then. And if we're being honest with ourselves, it's still pretty hard for us today to wrap our mind around the concept that we are made righteous by our faith alone. Dr. Pace, in one of the videos on the Scripture Shared app, seriously download it, it's awesome, said that today many Christians don't have a problem writing off some of those old Jewish ceremonial laws as unnecessary. Like, we don't really focus on how well we wash our hands or whether or not we eat bacon. I mean, come on, the best stuff is made from bacon. Most Christians don't think that their salvation hinges on whether or not they observe the Sabbath correctly. But Paul pushes it even farther than that. Paul not only says that those ceremonial laws can't make you righteous, but the moral ones as well. Those are the Ten Commandments. Paul saying that you can never be good enough in your actions. And as we know, Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount added to that and said, look, you see these Ten Commandments, there's no way you can follow them. They're showing you the standard, and I'm here to show you that you can't reach the standard. And that's hard, because if that's true, then the opposite logically is true as well. So, Pastor, are you telling me then it doesn't really matter what I do? So long as I trust in Jesus, then I'll be good to go? Well, I guess it all depends on what you mean by good to go. But more on that in a minute. Setting that aside, even though it's easy for us to shrug off some of those old ceremonial laws, we're very quickly to add on new rituals in our Christian faith that we think are essential, right? I mean, how much has the universal church over the centuries picked at and argued over things that we really think are important? Things like communion, how we do that. Who and when and how do we baptize people? What color the carpet in the sanctuary is supposed to be. Now, I'm not here to say that those things don't matter at all, except for maybe the carpet one. But you see what I'm saying. And if we are to take Paul seriously here, then maybe some of the things that we think are so essential aren't as essential as we think they are. 
And I bet, again, if we're, if we're to be honest with ourselves, I bet if we thought about it, we could think of some things that we do here at St. Luke's. That if I came in all of a sudden and said we were going to do that completely differently or not do it at all, that would make a lot of us very uncomfortable. Because you see, we, we get in our heads that we are made righteous by faith alone, but it is still very much a temptation for us today to want to earn our salvation. Here's the problem with works and religion as a means of getting to God. I think anytime somebody approaches religion in this way, you fall into one of two categories. Either it's, hey, I'm not that bad, or I'll never be good enough. If you're like me, you fall into that first category of, okay, I get that I'm a sinner, but I'm not really that bad, okay? I... I know that I need Jesus like we all need Jesus, but I go to church, I pay my taxes. Hey, I'm a pastor after all, come on. Like, I get it, but if they were gonna make a movie about the power of redemption, they wouldn't waste it on me because I don't need it that bad. Not nearly as much as this person needs Jesus. The problem with that mindset is it doesn't take seriously enough the depth and power of our sin. Like, we might have it in our head that we need to be saved, but if we go too quickly to that God's grace is sufficient part, then we might not realize the power and depth of what God has done for us. So I think I've told this story before, but it's really impacted my understanding of grace. Right after undergrad, I just graduated from undergrad, so I think about 24 years old. I'm coming home from Best Buy with a brand new DVD that I'm really excited to watch. And I take my eyes off the road for just a moment, looking down at my shiny new Star Trek The Next Generation Special Edition Best of DVD Collector Set just in time to look up and see my car plowing into another car that's turning through the intersection, an intersection that I have run right through. And after looking up and seeing that, yes, the light was red, and yes, this is my fault, I got so frustrated with myself for doing something so dumb as taking my eyes off the road for just a moment. But then I got out of the car and it got much worse. The passenger of the car that I had hit was noticeably pregnant. I mean, maybe a month away. And as I saw the scene around me unfold that I had created, my frustration was transformed into utter despair. Mom was noticeably hurt. Someone called an ambulance, they put her on her stretcher, put her in the ambulance and took mom and the baby to the hospital to make sure that they were all right. At one point, somebody probably saw something in me because they asked me if I was all right, said my color didn't look very good. And I got down on my knees as I was just overwhelmed in the moment. After things started to break up, the officer on the scene came to me and wrote me a ticket for running a red light and said, okay, you're free to go. In that moment, I felt like I deserved to go to jail for what I had just done. When I got home, I walked around the neighborhood just pleading with God, saying, God, please, you make sure that baby and mama are okay. I don't care what happens to me. That baby's got to be okay. And then I hear God say this to me in my heart. Thomas, now you have a better idea of what I died to save. 
Now you have a deeper appreciation of my grace. Because the simple fact is, either Jesus died for it all, or Jesus died in vain. There is no sliding scale of goodness that we could ever be good enough to make Christ's sacrifice unnecessary. And in that way, it's the same, no matter who we are or what we've done. Mama and baby, we're okay. I think the last time I told this story, I forgot to mention that part. (laughs) But I never forgot, friends, how quickly someone else's life could be completely altered forever just because of some dumb mistake that I had made. I got a powerful lesson of grace that day. And some people get grace more than others. You ever met those people that just really get grace, that really get God's love for them? I don't know, you know, sometimes they, they've been uh, set free of some addiction or something has happened in their life that they are majorly forgiven and it just bleeds into every area of their life. Like they just have so much supernatural love for people. Some people get grace more than others. I'm here to tell you that one day we will all get grace like that. Or maybe you're on the other side. Maybe you know you're a dirty, rotten sinner. And it shapes your entire identity. Oftentimes this is because of something that you did or did not do that has now formed and shaped your opinion about who you are. Like, Pastor, I hear you saying nice things like Jesus died for us and can forgive one of our sins, but you don't know what I've done. All those nice churchy sayings don't apply to me. And if you did know what I have done, you would be disgusted and ask me to leave. Maybe you see God less as a loving parent and more as an authority figure that just hasn't gotten around to punishing you yet. Maybe you've been feared into believing in Jesus because hell is not really that nice sounding of a place. Have you ever met someone who when they pray, all they seem to focus on is how bad they are? They keep God at a distance because they do get the depth of their sin. But there's no understanding of the love and grace that would compel a creator to make that sacrifice for them in the first place. See, that that side doesn't work either as a means of getting to God. Here's how Christianity is different. Christianity out of any other religion is a relationship based on a relationship with God, not on a list of rules in order to appease God. And so if it's based on a relationship, what God really wants is not your obedience to a certain set of laws, but God wants you. God wants your heart. God wants you to love him the same way that he loves you. And to be free of all the things that have enslaved your life. Okay, so let's let's talk about the thing that I've struggled with then, doctrinally here. Does that mean that we can do whatever we want? Should we continue to sin so grace may abound, right? Stay here. I like to move, man. It's hard. All right, I'm going to stand right here. I can tell that I'm getting into bad waters when uh, stuff is happening. If Jesus has died for our sins, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, right? Jesus has paid it all. Then what you're telling me logically is that I can do whatever I want in my lifetime, and it doesn't matter so long as I believe and trust in Jesus in the end. Right? I mean, that's what you're saying. Well, if you really want to push it there, then I think the answer is yes. That's right. 
But the problem with that question is it's still rooted in that works righteousness mentality. So if you really pushed Paul, I think you would say, yeah, okay, you're free to do whatever you want. I can be all things. I'm free to do anything. But I'm here to tell you, the more you get to know God, the more you love God, the more what you want to do will be the very thing that God has for you. There is more to life than getting to heaven or escaping hell. Life is about knowing and being known by Jesus. And it is through that relationship that you find the real heaven that you've been seeking. So if it's about a relationship, we can move past the legalism and focus on the relationship. So my wife and I have been married for about seven years now. And we have two kids that are under four. So we're like in this thing together, right? We're more than just two people throwing money into a mortgage or trying to keep two human beings alive. We are married and committed to one another. Now it's important that we never say never. We realize that there are temptations in the world and we would never say that it could not happen to us. But yeah, for the most part, we trust each other. We're not going anywhere. We're not gonna get divorced. But our marriage is about more than just not getting divorced. If on our wedding day, we said our vows to one another and high-fived and said, okay, we're married forever, but then never talked to each other, well, that would be a pretty empty marriage. That would be a pretty empty life. Same thing is true with our relationships with God. We go to church, we read our Bibles, we pray and spend time with God, not so that we could just stay married to God, but that we could deepen our relationship with Jesus. In the same way that I need to date my wife after we have gotten married, we live out the five inside out habits as a way of not earning salvation or righteousness, but as a way of cultivating our relationship with Christ. A relationship that will give you the freedom to do whatever you want to do, but the desire to live free in the Spirit. So what do you need to hear this morning? That what you do matters, not for your righteousness, but for your relationship. A relationship with God that bleeds into all of the other areas of your life. A relationship that will set you free from the bondage of both yourself and of the world. A relationship that will find in the very nature of what it is that you were created to desire. So yeah, in that regards, what you do absolutely matters. There is real pain and real brokenness outside of our relationship with Christ. Or do you need to hear that you are good enough? Again, not because of what you did or did not do, but because of what Jesus Christ has done for you. At the end of the scripture, Paul says, we eagerly await the hope of our righteousness. Have you ever eagerly awaited something? Maybe you're eagerly awaiting the Astros' first World Series championship. Friends, that's got nothing on this. One day, one day, all of your desires, pursuits, dreams, and passions will come aligned into the will that God has for you. That means that you will no longer want or desire anything that is not life-giving for you. There will be no temptation or sin or brokenness in your life anymore when we have become fully redeemed in him. That's the heaven, friends, that we seek after. So receive the hope of your righteousness through faith. And then get to know the one who is responsible for that hope. Let's pray. 
Father God, I thank you that a message that is so simple is still something that tugs at our hearts. It's still something that is hard to grasp, that you would cross the distance for us. So, Father God, help us to live into that redemption in a way that instills our identity in you. Not because of what we've done, but because of who you are. And then may we continue to fall more and more in love with you. In your son's Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.